Hello, hello, good afternoon, good evening, good night, good morning, whatever time it is, wherever you are, when you happen to be listening. This is the Andrew Lake Podcast. My name is Andrew, without a doubt. And today, I'd like to share with you a personal diagnosis on myself for the multiple personalities borderline disorder. I don't like to use the word disorder because it does imply a sort of tension there. And there is tension between personalities within me, but I think we'll be able to understand it in a bit more of a flowing sort of way as I try to explain to you what multiple personalities means. So I actually have seven different personalities. These are almost like entirely different people that come out and express themselves in different situations. Sort of like if you imagine a puppet show, a children's puppet show. Every now and then, the puppeteer will poke his hand up with a puppet on, and he'll be talking with that character, and that character will act in a certain way, and then they'll put their arm down and put up another character, put up another puppet. And that will be totally different looking, totally different talking, with a different voice, a different accent, and all these different goals and motivations and ways of relating to the other puppets. And this is basically what multiple personality disorder is like. It's the one puppeteer. It's the one man behind the curtain. But the audience only ever sees little fragments of these puppets as they poke their head out at different times during the play. So what I'm offering here is a bit of a, an amalgamation of multiple maps of personality. Personality is a broad subject in the field of psychology, and there's many different ways you can go about analyzing personality. But fundamentally, as I understand it, personality is how you talk and behave in relation to an emotion. So let's imagine, for argument's sake, there's about... 20 different fundamental human emotions. You might have anger, you might have frustration, you might have greed, you might have happiness, you might have love, or any of these which way that we can talk about. And these form the spectrum of human emotion. They can also vary in intensity, and they can also vary in the frequency for how often someone feels those emotions. But personality is how you talk and how you behave as a reaction to an emotion. And within each emotion, there are a range of different responses that can be taken up. So for example, let's say someone frequently has feelings of hate. Now, they might be talking a certain way because they feel this hate within them. They might be acting a certain way because of the hate that is in them. But they don't have to act that way. There's a range of actions that they can choose from. Now that range is not unlimited. There are certain actions which you would never do if you were feeling hateful. There is a certain variety of actions that we can call hateful. There are certain varieties of words and phrases and ways of speaking that we can say are hateful. And this is the case with the whole spectrum of human emotion. And each person has a different way of, first of all, experiencing their emotions. And then also, they choose from the range of options, subconsciously of course, of how to respond to those emotions. And then we have a frequency of these actions and a frequency of these words, and when they repeat themselves often enough, we can say, well, this is a repetition, this is a trait, this is something that you do on a regular basis, so this action is a trait. Now, usually when we talk about personality analysis, we're putting together five or six different traits. So you might have the big five personality trait model, which is a summary of all different broad categories of traits and personality actions, and they have correlating emotions. Or you might have the Enneagram, which would be a smaller clump of traits 
and their complementary relationship. And then we can also have a more like a Carl Jung sort of analogy and analysis on personality, which is more like a character. So when you have someone who has a number of traits acting within a story, you can say that that character is a role that is being played out within a story. And these wouldn't be so much more of like the introversion, extroversion, or conscientious or agreeable or anything like that. That would be more like the king or the jester or the perfectionist or the mother. So kings have ways of acting. They have collections of emotions and ways of talking. Jest jesters, the court jester, has a different way of acting and they have a collection of things that would be appropriate to that role in the story. And so what I'd like to use today is a sort of an amalgamation of all these different ways of talking about personality. Now, another thing that I'll mention is that emotions and actions, and of course words as well, speaking as well, is nested in the composition of a person, which is how they first came into contact with an emotion. So when you first feel an emotion for the first time, there's going to be a situation in which that happened. There's going to be people around with their personalities inf inflecting onto you. And there's also going to be certain words that are said or certain thoughts that are had around that situation. And depending on the intensity of that situation, then that emotion will be latched onto the personality traits or the behaviors or the words. And this is all how your childhood upbringing influences the development of your personality. Now, the other thing I wanted to circle back to was the values. So your values develop through a hierarchy and is a little bit further outside the realm of personality per se. Of course, your personality is nested within values and each emotion is sprung off your network of values, as in what's important to you and what you think is the most optimal thing to be working towards or doing. So if we look at how values develop, we can see that personality springs off the different waves of development. So for example, in spiral dynamics, you might have someone at stage blue who values family and community. You might have someone at stage orange, which values progress, hard work and achievement. And then you might have someone at stage green, which values sharing, understanding with other people empathy, saving the planet, Greenpeace, that sort of thing. And then you'll have someone at stage yellow, which values learning, finding new ideas, learning about new systems, expanding knowledge. And then you'll have someone at stage turquoise, which values holistic thinking, big picture thinking, practical thinking, the dissolution of boundaries. So all these levels of psychological development have very different processes behind them. All these value structures give for a very different range of behaviors and words within personality. So let's get personal. Let me tell you what my seven major personalities are. So these come out in different situations and they often conflict with each other, as you'll see. And as we describe them, just think about how contradictory they are and what it would be for one personality to meet another one. And this is where there's a lot of psychological tension, which is when you have one personality which is facing another personality, because the only way split personalities can exist is by denying the existence of others. So, Number one, the nihilist victim. Believe it or not, I do have nihilism in me. I do have a tendency to say that everyone is out to get me. I have a feeling that 
Someone's going to be after me. Someone's going to be attacking me. And this makes me very defensive. This makes me very edgy. It makes me very uneasy when this comes up. Granted, it doesn't come up too often. It's much a much older part of me, and I've learned to think it through and deal with it and recognize it much better these days. But this came up when I was a teenager a lot, and I was severely depressed and just had a lot of social anxiety, and I couldn't stand being around people, and I was always arguing with people, and I was always out to sort of be on the attack so that someone wouldn't attack me first. So the nihilist is a very strong personality, and that person who is a nihilist and wants to play the victim is going to be going around thinking that everyone's out to get them. They're going to be thinking that everything is an intrusion on their personal space. They're going to be thinking, I need to put up a good defense and I need to really state my boundaries strongly. Number two, personality number two, is the ambitious worker. So I love progress. I love hard work. I love doing the job right. I love getting on with things, taking action, and doing things by the book, doing things correctly. And this means telling people how things need to be done, having clear goals, making sure people are working in the correct way, following systems, and really just doing things the right way and really stepping up towards the ideal. Now, this is great for ambition in business. It's great for working in a job. It's great for saving money. It's great for building assets and all those sorts of things which are related to the world of progress. The third personality that I have is the goofy comedian. So I often see this coming out and it can come from nervousness. It can come from a willing to, uh, a desire to please people and wanting to be accepted. But basically, the goofball is the one that just wants to have fun. They turn everything into a joke. And I've got a lot of slapstick in me. I've got a lot of cheesy jokes in me. And at certain times, it's really good to embrace the cheesy nature, the cheesy side of someone. And if it's done in the right way with the right people, it can be quite rewarding to have a goof around. But that's just one part of me that wants to come out, that always wants to have fun and have a laugh. If you take that too far, it can become a bit of a drag. If you're always trying to have a laugh, if you're always trying to have fun, and it becomes a bit awkward sometimes. The fourth personality that I have within me is the hedonist thrill seeker. Now, this might come as a bit of a shock because sometimes, a lot of the times these days, I'm... I wouldn't call myself a hedonist. Very much not so. I'm much more about cultivating subtlety, the details of the nature of perception and abstinence and taking care of myself and not really going for these outrageous experiences. But to be honest, throughout my life, I've had a lot of thrill-seeking experiences, a lot of powerful crazy experiences which are intense experiences and these can come in many forms the hedonist comes in many forms not just with drinking and partying but also just with other adrenaline pumping activities so the hedonist is the one that is always out to have a strong feeling and they try and get that feeling through gross mechanical actions, which means actions with your body, so sports and things like that, which are using your muscles, using your limbs, using your arms in a situation. And that can come across in lots of different situations. The fifth personality that I have within me is the lover. I love to love people. I love to tell people how great they are. Tell people how beautiful they are. Tell people that I think they're wonderful. And this one is a really tricky one because it can make people feel very uncomfortable if it's done in the inappropriate situation and if they're not ready for it, which can be very frustrating for someone who is the lover, someone who wants to give love and give praise to people and really feel good when they're around people. 
needs to be accepted in order for them to do that. And not everyone is ready to accept love. Not everyone is, is ready to take in praise because depending on your psychological composition, it is actually possible to feel uneasy and unworthy of praise. You might have a low self-esteem. You might have an inadequate self-image. And then when someone comes along and starts telling you all these amazing things about you and how much they get out, they get from you, then it's going to be like that's jarring with their self-image and they can't square it. It doesn't make sense. This is usually done all on a subconscious level. So it's very complicated and all this stuff happens in the background. But I love to love people. I love to... And this doesn't just go for intimate partners. Of course, when I'm with an intimate partner, it is very intense. I really get into them. And I really just try and do all that I can for them and just put in the best that I can, put the best foot forward. And this also comes across with friendship and even with workmates or other situations where you might meet someone new and you have this personality come out of the lover. and You might look into their eyes and have a deep sense of feeling for them. It's like, oh, I'm so pleased to meet you. And that can be quite unsettling for someone who doesn't know me or someone who isn't ready for that. And it's like, I really want to be feeling good around you. There's a natural tendency. Well, the basic principle of the lover is that I feel good around you. And that should be something that I share with you. You make me feel good just by being with you. I accept you for who you are. It's just, you're not even doing anything special. You're not doing anything amazing. You haven't done anything directly for me, materialist, like in terms of a material way. And that's what's a little bit confusing for some people as well, because we assume that love is something that has to be earned. We assume that praise is something that is only given when it's deserved. Love comes after a certain number of conditions have been fulfilled. And this is why the personality of the lover is so, is so hard to get out there. It's so hard to express. It's so hard to live. And I think probably out of all these, the lover is the one that has got the most taboo around it. The lover can also be quite easily misinterpreted as in a romantic interest because it is possible to love someone in a non romantic way, a completely non-romantic way. And a lot of people don't understand that. A lot of people mistake romance and sex with love. These are two totally different things or three totally different things. A sex interest and a romantic interest is different again in addition to a love interest. And you could see this come through sometimes in bromance. So bromance is when two guys, two blokes are really feeling fun together and they're really having a good laugh and they might have had a couple of drinks and they end up saying, man, I really love you, bro. Yeah, I love you, bro. I love you too, bro. That skit has been played out on many different movies and in lots of different comedy sketches. And it's quite funny when that sketch comes up, but that's what's happening here. That's the feeling of love trying to come out. Of course, some people need to be a little bit intoxicated to feel like they're allowed to express their lover side. But that's, in a nutshell, the lover. The sixth personality that I have within me is the eccentric. So this is the weirdo. I've scratched my head about this for a long time. And what I've come up with is that the idea of being weird or the urge to be weird and to be different comes from this urge to make an obtuse impression on someone. So I've got lots of different weird interests and I've got lots of weird stories. And what I've found myself doing is pulling out these stories when I've known that the person listening would be a little bit unsettled by it a little bit confused or a little bit shocked by it. So the, the eccentric likes to have the shock factor. Probably the most classic example of a, an eccentric is Salvador Dali. 
who was a surrealist painter. And he formed this entire career out of being an eccentric and being weird. And he would do all sorts of crazy things like filling up his car with cauliflower and then driving it around. Or painting a picture of his wife with bacon on her face. Or any number of other strange things. And he really got this shock value. He really got so much of an impression from the people around him because he had this weirdness about him. And it's quite charming. When someone is eccentric in a charming way, it is, it is very beautiful. It's quite wonderful. But the other side of it is that sometimes you make people feel uncomfortable and they're not ready for it. And that makes them reject you. So eccentricity can really divide the room. It can really make people love you or hate you. And I've definitely got a lot of that within me. Usually it's quite subconscious whether I'm being weird for the sake of being weird. Often it's just what I find interesting. And a lot of the time in my life, I remember when I was a kid, we were doing a woodwork class. And the class project was to make a clock. So you could make a clock in any shape, way or possible and we were chopping up wood with it, getting different pieces with it, doing all these different designs for them. And so anyway, everyone is working on this, this clock for a couple of lessons, and I'm really buried in this work. I'm really into it. I'm really enjoying it. And there it came to a point where we got to the end of the class, and I started looking around, and my clock was just so far off the planet that it was completely unlike anything else. So most people would have like a circle with a shellfish on it, or they do a car shaped clock, or they do a square clock with numbers on it, this sort of thing. Mine was completely out with this, all these different angles and spikes and black colors and different things stuck onto it and machinery stuff like gadgets and all these weird things and everyone was sort of you know a few people sort of rolled their eyes and said what's going on here and it was quite funny because my mum hung that clock up in her living room and it kept getting funny comments as people you know people would come and visit and say well huh, that's a very strange shaped clock I don't think it even told the time but the moral of the story was in that project in that class project I was just doing what I liked I was just doing what I thought would be a cool clock. And yet, when we got to the end of the class and looked around, it was so weird. It was so wacky. Now, the seventh and final personality that I'd like to share with you is the philosopher or the insightful thinker. So this comes across a lot in some of my conversations, which is, me trying to share insight, me trying to share ideas, to articulate psychological maps, demonstrate a knowledge of philosophies or ways of thinking or theories of mind, these sorts of things. And this is someone who can be a little bit full of themselves, they're a little bit overconfident, and it can at other times be someone who is very helpful to the people around him. Now, if you want to be a philosopher and you want to be insightful, like all of these personalities that are within me, they all have an appropriate time and an appropriate place, and they all have a different origin. If you try and be a philosopher in some situations, some people just aren't in the mood, and they can put you down for it. They can belittle you for it. And that's fair enough. They might not be open to these sorts of insights. They might not be open to these sorts of ideas. For them, the world might be simple. It doesn't need to be made complex. But the philosopher is a big one for me. And it's a side of me that I'd really like to bring out more and more. And I'd like to share more and more with people. So those are my seven kinds of personalities or my seven bundles of traits and you can see that they all act in a different way. And you can see that they're all in contradiction to each other at different times, depending on the situation. 
A lot of these are things that people all deal with. We all deal with being the victim and being a nihilist in some way or another. We also all have to deal with ambition. We also have to deal with our humour. Humour is not always goofy. Now, goofy is just how my humour comes out. But everyone has a sense of humour in some sort of way, and some people pursue that trait more than others. Believe it or not, but even the most stick-in-the-mud people do have a sense of humour, because there's always somewhere in the personality a sense of happiness, a sense of light-heartedness, even if it's totally buried. Hedonism is another one that we all have to deal with. Raw sensory pleasure is just one of the most fundamental phases of human development that we all go through and we all have to contend with. Some people don't grow out of it. Some people don't integrate it. Love is also something we all have to deal with. I don't think everyone differentiates sex, sexual interest, romantic interest, and love in that way because love, love can apply to all three, but also love can be a thing into itself. Eccentricity is not something that everyone deals with. Some people are not eccentric. Some people are totally all about conforming and doing standard role play and doing very simple and what you'd call ABC actions within a situation. And the philosopher, the insightful person, is not... It's, it's much rarer than these previous ones. Like, not everyone has to come up with this idea of sharing their knowledge with people. It's only after you've cultivated a certain amount of knowledge that you really feel the impulse to share knowledge at all. And that whole process of what to do once you've amassed a whole bunch of knowledge is a story in and of itself. But there are all sorts of other personalities that aren't mentioned here. For example, the perfectionist. There's no way in hell that I'm a perfectionist. I want to do the job right. But some people have to have it right. They have to have it in an ideal way, and they need to put all their energies into making things neat, tying up loose ends, crossing the T's, dotting the I's, these sorts of things. So the, the perfectionist is just another example of a personality. Now, everyone to a degree has some sort of fragmentation within their personality, and that's because... Different situations require different actions and they induce different emotions. Now, some people are more fragmented than others. Some people do seem to be simply acting the same way in all sorts of situations, all sorts of environments, and they're very consistent. But everyone, to some extent, has a degree of consistency. Now, the reason I've said I've got seven personalities is because my degree is very dramatic. Think of the ambitious worker trying to do the right thing in conjunction with the lover. So the lover is very different to someone who's trying to work hard and do the right thing. These are completely contradictory personalities. What about the goofy comedian and the philosopher? These couldn't be any more different to each other. The goofy comedian is all about being, having a laugh, making a fool of himself, being an idiot. And the philosopher is all about being proud, about being serious, about being profound, about being heavy, and talking about heavy subjects. So the goofy comedian and the philosopher are at completely different ends of the spectrum. They have completely different ways of expressing their emotions. They, all, they both have very different emotions. So I hope you can start to see how when these different personalities come into contact with each other, there can be a lot of tension. Have you ever had someone do something that was out of character? You've had someone do something that you really didn't expect them to do? Or someone's been in a situation where you've said, that's a totally different side to you that I've never seen. That's a totally different part of you that you've never expressed. So usually when that happens, there's a different personality poking their head up. There's a different puppet coming out onto the stage. 
Usually when we're with a certain group of friends, we put out one puppet onto the stage. And then we go to a different environment. And then we'll put up a different puppet with our different friends. And if these two worlds, or these two different situations were ever to meet, it would be a complete mess for the person who's between them because they wouldn't know how to act. They wouldn't know what mask to put on, which puppet to put forward, which one to use. And this can create quite a lot of anxiety. This is really the root cause of all social anxiety. Basically, fundamentally, social anxiety is, at the root of it, all about expressing yourself authentically. How do you express your emotions authentically? Now, you might be having all sorts of different emotions that you don't know how to express, and you might have emotions which you feel you shouldn't express in a certain way, and depending on the situation, different emotions are going to come up. So you can see that it becomes very complicated, it becomes very tricky to use personality in an optimal way. What's the solution? What's the thing that we can do if we are diagnosed with multiple personalities? And I think fundamentally, or really the only thing you can do is accept them and be comfortable with them. It definitely becomes a lot more easy to accept them if you can talk about them and you can put them forward as separate entities unto themselves. Now, there's two things that I'd like to say about the complexity of personality and people. On one side, people are always complex. People are complex because every human being is an infinite being. They're a multidimensional being. And so on that side, in that case, all human beings are complex. Now, on the other side, there are degrees of personality complexity depending on the range of emotions that a person has, different situations that they have, and the range of behaviors and thoughts and words that they have. And on that side of the spectrum, some people are more complex than others. You can say that someone has a simple personality. So for example, you can say, take this, this list of seven personalities that I've got. You can say that someone is just two things. So you might have someone who's just an ambitious worker and they are also a lover. So they might just be those two things. So they might go to work and they'll spend the majority of their week at work and they'll be very good at being ambitious and working hard and making progress while they're at work. And then they'll come home to their family, their wife or husband or kids or whoever it is that they're living with, and they will be very good at loving them, at caring for them. The carer is a little bit different to the lover, but for now let's just lump them together. So the lover and the ambitious worker can be two sides to the same person, but that would not be as complex as someone who is a nihilist and also an ambitious worker and a goofy comedian and a hedonist and a lover and an eccentric and a philosopher. So in that sense, some personalities are more complex than others. So allow me to circle back to the solution of accepting all of these personalities, allowing these personalities to come out as they wish. I don't know what it means to try and merge them together and to use them in a more masterful sort of way. I don't know what it would look like to bring them out. And partly that's what I've been trying to do with these conversations because by letting these conversations come out, and you can hear the things that I've said in the past which are clearly from one or two of these different personalities, and then you can listen to them right next to each other. So in a sense, these conversations are my attempt to really express how I feel on the whole entire range of personality and emotions. And that's why there's a lot of contradiction in these different conversations that I have, these different things that I say. And it's also been quite weird for some people to, who only know one side of me 
to hear these other sides of me and be shocked, like, what is going on there? This is a whole side of you I've never known about. And I don't know what this would mean for an intimate relationship. Imagine, imagine having an intimate relationship with someone and you don't feel you can be certain personalities around them. And that's really what a good human connection is, is someone who can feel like they've been all sorts of different personalities and they can do a range of things around them. So in a sense, an intimate relationship with me is very colorful. It's very, there's a whole lot of variety, a lot of intensity, but not everyone likes that. Not everyone likes these ups and downs and these ins and outs and these intensities and highs and lows and all those, that sort of jazz. So it's really a matter of how do I express myself right from the get-go without revealing too much and also learn to contend with bringing out certain sides of me in certain situations. I guess ultimately we just want authenticity. We don't want to hurt people. We don't want to intrude on people. And we also want to be accepted. We also want to be understood. We want to allow people to feel comfortable around us and also feel comfortable around other people. And that should include all the different kinds of emotions that we have. Imagine someone who you'd feel comfortable being angry around. Or you'd feel comfortable feeling vulnerable around them. Or you'd feel comfortable being goofy around them. Or you'd feel comfortable being profound and being a philosopher and being insightful around them. At different times, these all come out. And then at the same time, you can feel the same way about them. When they are expressing something, make sure you accept them. Make sure you listen to them. When anyone does something or anyone says something, it's because they're feeling a certain emotion. They've got something compelling them to say it. Now, there are degrees of successful ways of expressing emotions. Some are expressed better than others. So make sure you're always understanding that people are struggling with this. Someone might be saying something very frustrating to you and very tedious to you, but you've just got to understand that they're trying to get something out and they're struggling to get it out. They might not even know what emotion it's coming from. For example, the perfectionist is very much propelled by disgust. You have to be very strong with your sense of disgust in order to be a perfectionist. The whole thing that drives perfectionism is trying to get away from what is bad, what is icky, what is wrong, what is disorderly disarray, these sorts of things. And when you understand this, try and just be more understanding. Don't be condescending. It's very easy to analyze people when you get your head around certain personality aspects. Because of course, I can put these psychological maps onto other people the more I understand them myself. But I really need to remember how to do that in a caring way in an understanding way, in a loving way, without being condescending, without being aggressive, and not letting my own emotions and motivations get the better of me. Thanks very much for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. And that's all I have to say for now.